Flattery will get you nowhere. Um, and you know the, um, I need, um, when we're quarter till? Quarter till. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I didn't realize last time, but at quarter till I'll give you the fist, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one. <laughs> okay. And then that 10 to give her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And that's, that's 45 minutes in that quarter. Oh, is that what? Oh, yeah. wow. Thanks, Dave. What? Wait, what did you say? He's just kidding. It's not quartered at 3. It's 45 minutes in. He's, he's going to be hard. Huh? Making sure he does. He does that. Well, for and me. actually, my, my preference is quarter till. Okay. So that we can stay on schedule. Oh, really? As close that, to is that what you want? That's to going to be a half hour from now. We need to roll. Okay. Go ahead. Are we rolling? Good afternoon, sir. My name is Gwendolyn Coley. I'm with the Department of, Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, today is October 20th, uh, 2005. We're here in Denver, Colorado. If you would introduce yourself to us, give us your name, uh, spell your name also for us, and tell us where you're from. I'm <coughs> Dr. Frank... McGloan, M-C-G-L-O-N-E, from Denver, Colorado. Okay. What, where were you before you went into the military? Yeah, I was in Denver in, the medic, in medical school. What school was it? University of Colorado School of Medicine. And how long had you been in school? Oh, I started college in 39, and I was in medical school to a 48, or 38. 38, okay. Um, what was the, the reason that you went into the military? Well, they came and talked to us when I was in medical school and uh, kind of talked us into joining. The, and I was a first lieutenant in the, while I was in medical school. They talked you into joining? Yes, yes. <laughs> What did your family think about you joining? Well, they thought it was fine. There was no, when, when we joined, we were at peace. And what year was this that you joined? Probably 36. And what branch did you go into? Medical Corps. In Army and Navy? Army Medical Corps, Army yes. Medical Corps, okay. Mm -hmm. um, since you were in medical school, did they allow that medical school training to transfer into the military? To a degree, and, and we had to take a couple of weeks on active duty each year. So you were in the reserve? Yes. Okay. Um, tell me how, how that was, how that worked, being in the reserve at that time. Well, we uh, were on active duty for two weeks at a time, once a year. and. The active duty was not medical related. It was actually I was sent to Fort Warren in Cheyenne, Wyoming, or in Wyoming, and was the medical officer for two weeks for a, a group that a cavalry group, and I had to go on field trips and ride horses for 25 miles, and I never had ridden a horse before. How was that experience? A little rough, a little painful. They tried to teach me to post, and for 25 miles, trying to post was a little strenuous. And posting is where you're not sitting, but you're going up and down. Yes, and you have just a little English saddle. Have, have you ridden since that time? No. <laughs> Okay, so yeah. two weeks a year you would go out and, and do your active duty training. Yes. Now, I know now in the reserve you also train one weekend a month. Did they have it, was it that way then? No. Just twice a year, I mean two weeks a year? Yeah. And how long did that last where, where you did the reserve? Probably two years, and then I was called to active duty. Do you remember what month that was? I think I was called to active duty in March of 1940. We weren't in the war yet, but we were supporting the English stance in the war. Where you were called to active duty, and where were you going to be sent? Well, actually, I was sent to Fitzsimmons Hospital in Denver. 
I was a ward officer for a little over a year at Fitzsimmons. And what did that duty entail? Practicing medicine, running a medical ward. And Fitzsimmons is a VA hospital? Was it a military hospital? What kind of hospital was it? It was a military hospital at that time. So these were service members who were coming from where? A lot of them are still from World War I that we were taking care of. What type of, what type of injuries were you treating? What type of medicine were you practicing? Most of it, uh, probably more than half was tuberculosis at that time. Really? We had, I think we had a death once a, once a day for tuberculosis at that time at Fitzsimmons. And we did have a lot of older veterans from World War I with arthritis and various disabling illnesses. So you did that for about a year? About a year. And then what was your duty? Well, then we organized a, then when World War II came along, we organized a general hospital with the University of Colorado, the 29th General Hospital, who was going to function as a hospital unit. To go where? Well, originally we were sent to Fort Meade, Maryland to get ready to go into the European War. All of our equipment and material was sent to North Africa to get ready for the invasion. We all were told to buy winter clothes, which we did. I still have a heavy winter overcoat. And suddenly, we were transferred to the South Pacific. <laughs> so we didn't need our winter overcoats. And we traveled by train across the country from Maryland to California to stage for going to we didn't know where. How long was your train ride? Oh, probably about three days. Now, while you were out in Maryland, did you have a did you get to go home at all, or was it just you well, stayed in Maryland? Well, I had that by that time I'd been married, and we had one child, and they came and lived in Maryland. How and long were you in Maryland? A little over a year before we were transferred. Okay, and so you caught the train, your family stayed in Maryland? For, so, yeah, for a month or two and then moved back to Denver. Okay, and so you went out to California to board a boat, I guess. Yes. What, do you remember what the name of the boat was? No, uh, yes, Nordum. Okay. Nordum. And you were heading, you found out you are heading to where? When we took off, we didn't know where we were going. The second day out, they told us we were going to New Caledonia. And what was your mission there going to be? To set up a general hospital to take care of the casualties from the South Pacific, uh, Guadalcanal, New Georgia, and from the various invasion of the islands, which we had a lot of tropical illness and a lot of injuries. What type of tropical uh, ailments? Well, amoebic dysentery was one of the common ones. And uh, I was in charge of a gastrointestinal service, so I probably saw more amoebic dysentery than most doctors ever do. M more than probably doctors want to do. Yes. Um, what was the treatment for, for dysentery? Well, we had a shot called emetine that helped, and then some oral medications with arsenic in it, and it helped. Now, won't it cured, can, I'm sorry, go ahead. And it cured most of it. Won't arsenic kill you? I say it killed. But won't arsenic kill you? Oh, yeah, arsenic, bigger doses will kill you, yes. But the doses we used, of course, killed the amoeba, not the patient. Okay. 
How long were you there? We were in New, New Caledonia probably about a year and a half while this war was going on. What kinds of um, other events were going on around? Well, New Caledonia became a staging area for a lot of things in the South Pacific. We had, at times, over 200,000 troops on the island. And uh, it was a place where the Navy stationed a lot of their ships while they were in between battles. So it was a, it was a busy, busy island. What was life like there? Well, it was uh, comfortable. It, it was about the same latitude south as Hawaii is north. So we had a couple of months of rainy weather. The rest was fairly pleasant. We lived in tents. The whole time? The whole time, but the tents, we fortunately had sea bees on the island. And the Seabees came and built a real nice hospital with cement floors and the plastic material and the walls. And for the officers, they built tents with wood floors, wood sides, and permanent tents. No, the windows were screens, not no glass, but it was comfortable. And you were an officer, of course. Yes. What was your rank by then? By then I was a major. Okay. So you stayed there a year and a half or so. Yes. And then where'd you go? Okinawa. It took us 60 days. By then, we, the ships didn't have names. They were victory ships, fairly cheap. We had... Uh, our officers slept in the bay, in the bay. We had four levels of cots, and uh, uh, forty officers in a fairly small place. In the, and the reason it took us sixty days, we periodically pulled in. We were in a convoy to various islands because there were too many submarines, Japanese submarines, and we had to get out of the way of the submarines. Did, now, when you were going through, did you know that the reason you were being detoured was because of submarines? Oh, yes. What would you think about that? Well, we, we were hoping we, they didn't hit us. <laughs> and, and how old were you then? Probably 30. So 30. you were fairly old to go into the military during that time, correct? Yeah, I graduated from medical school and uh, maybe 28. Okay. Um, and there were a lot, I'm, I'm gathering that there were a lot of other people there who were much, much younger. Well, not necessarily. We, most of them in our group were older because they were doctors who had been on the staff of the medical school or in practice in Denver. So I'd say the average age was in the 30s. Okay. So these were the people who were with this general hospital with you. These were people you knew. Oh, these yes. These were your members of your reserve unit? No. They were members of the medical school and, uh, and practicing in Denver. And I knew them as colleagues. Do you remember some uh, of their names? Oh, yeah. Dr. Philpott, Dr. Haley, we had one doctor from St. Louis, Dr. Vornis, uh, Dr. John Foster was a surgeon, became our commanding officer. Dr. Matchett became quite a famous orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Boy, I could. So you went to Okinawa, you eventually got to Okinawa yeah. after a 60 day travel, a 60 yeah. day passage. What did you do in Okinawa? Well, we, we got there. There was still a little activity going on. We set up camp where they told us to. And after a week, we found out it was a minefield. <laughs> and 
they get the mines cleared out. Uh, and we saw a few planes knocked down. Just above us, where our camp was, there were cliffs with caves in them. And we could see the Japanese marching around up there. But there were so few, they couldn't do any harm. And we were getting ready for the Japanese invasion. And uh, after we were there, I think a few months, we dropped the bomb and everybody was elated. How far away were you at that point? From Japan? About 200 miles. And we had, I think, well over 200,000 troops ready to go. Now, that you were in Okinawa? Yes. Okay. They were getting ready. Okinawa was going to be the takeoff place for the invasion of Japan. So you said you were elated, well, or lots of people were elated. Yeah, because we knew the war was over. And then you would get to go home? No, they... <laughs> We thought we would, but they sent our unit to Korea. Really? Yeah. What'd you do in Korea? Well, Korea, the Japanese had completely had the Koreans underground. They didn't let them learn anything. They didn't let them go to school. And uh, the Japanese had entire control of Korea. But when the war was over, fortunately, they pulled out. But, but they were sending us up to Korea to take care of the casualties if there was a problem. But Korea had been so subjugated, they couldn't fix anything. It took us six hours to go from Incheon, which is a port city, to Seoul on the train, because the train stopped four times because they didn't realize how to put water in the boilers. When we got to Seoul, the train station was like Denver's used to be, underground, it was filled with water and they didn't know how to get the water out. And it took them a long time to learn, but when they learned, they learned fast. But when we were there, the plumbing, they didn't have any decent plumbing. They didn't know how to fix anything. And we were, uh, the, the Japs had pulled out, so we didn't have many casualties. And uh, I think we were just there two months when we got sent home. What was your primary mission there? Because you guys were medical. Yes. Who were you working with? Who were you treating? We were treating, supposedly we were treating casualties if Koreans and Japan, Japs got in a fight. And also, we were treating the sick Koreans. And we being the only general hospital, we had uh, patients, soldiers from other organizations on the island, on Korea. You mean other nations? No, other, others of our country. Okay. And we had uh, some of them, but we weren't very busy. And uh, by then we had a commanding officer, Dr. Foster, who was originally from Denver. And uh, he knew we were anxious to get home. And so uh, he helped arrange for us to get transferred back to this country. How did you feel about that? I, oh, we were elated. Some of them flew home, and some of us went by ship. Which one did you go by? I went by ship. How long did it take you? That took us, as I remember, six or seven days. And when we arrived, we arrived in Seattle. And at that time, people were very patriotic. And when our ship came into the bay, 
there were bands playing and people waving flags. It was very different than now. How was it? How'd you feel uh, pulling in with with all of the patriotism oozing out? Oh, it felt good. And fortunately, one of our Denver people was had become a general and lived in Seattle. And somehow he got word that three or four of us were on the ship. And he was at the ship side waving to us and got us off real quick and took us to his house where his wife had fixed fresh salad and we had milk, fresh fruit that we hadn't had for two years. And it was a great reception. Do you remember his name? Uh, Oh, I, I should. Uh, uh, <laughs> I know I'm Ed Durbin. 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 Okay. How long did you stay in Seattle before you came back to Denver? Just a few days. We got on a very crowded train. My wife didn't trust airplanes then, so I had to go by train, and uh, we were on the train. I think it took us two and a half days, very crowded, but we got here. So what was the reception like once you got back to Denver? Oh, everybody was glad to see us, of course. And we were glad to see them. Did you spend much, in, much more time in, with the military, or was that it for you? That was practically it. I, we had to go out to Fort Logan to retire. We were given the opportunity, if we wanted to stay in the service, to stay in the reserve and get one increase in rank. And uh, I decided not to stay in. So you were still a major at that point? I was a major. I, I, they did, I was made a lieutenant colonel. But I became inactive right away. Okay. So what did you do after you got out of the military? Well, I went back into practice of medicine in Denver. Okay. What, um, what area or specialty? Well, I was internal medicine and gastroenterology. And later I got into geriatrics. How long were you in practice? I still am after 60 some years, not very active now, but I'm still doing a little. Doing a little, okay. Yeah. Um, let me ask a bit about, because uh, I know that when, when you're in the military, even though we have our jobs to do, it's not all work. Yeah. What did you do for recreation when you were in? Well, we had uh, New Caledonia. I was put in charge of our, I used to be a baseball player, and I was put in charge of our athletic teams. And we fixed up a ball field. And we had a good enlisted men's baseball team. We won the South Pacific Championship. And our officers, we had half a dozen good players, especially one good pitcher. And uh, we played other officers' teams on the island. We used to play the 1st Marine uh, Division. They were the ones that went in on the various islands. They made the landings on New Georgia and New Caledonia. We'd play them one week. They'd go off on a mission. They'd come back a month later. We'd say, where's your second baseman? Well, they'd say, oh, he got bumped off. We'd ask him where the third baseman was. Oh, he lost his leg. They just very casually, they were a tough outfit. And we, there were a couple others. And then the New Zealanders had some troops on the island. And we played different sports with New Zealanders. So we had quite a bit of recreation. Now, did your unit lose anyone? Not in casualties. Uh, we had a few real sick ones, but nobody died. 
So you all went over and all came back. Yeah. That's we always a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you came back, you set up your practice, um, you ha had your family. Yeah. Tell me about your children. Did any of them choose to go into the military? No. I have one son that's a doctor, one daughter that's a nun. Really? And uh, one other daughter that uh, works in social service work. Okay. What about grandchildren? Did anyone else decide to go into the well, military? I did have one son that went into the service, and uh, he died. In the service? It, no, he was out of the service by the time he died. What branch did he go into? He was in the Army. Okay. Um, I asked you before we were rolling the, the, the videotape uh, how long you had been in Denver. Yeah. And you said 92 years. Yes. And that's how old you are also. Yes. Yeah. When's your birthday? May 5th. Okay. What advice would you offer to young folks or um, anyone who's considering service going into the military? How did that shape you? I think uh, there are a lot of advantages to it. And I think for the right kind of person, it, it could be ideal. I think some people aren't equipped for it and shouldn't do it. But I think many are, it is good for them. Okay. What more would you like to add, um, whether it's about your military career or, or military time or anything else you'd like to add? Because this is your story. No, I think it's, we carried it pretty well. Okay. Well, I do appreciate you coming in today to share your story with us. Thank you. Um, I think we have to get a couple of pictures. We and already did that. We got pictures, okay. Okay. So I appreciate it. Okay, we're rolling. Now, I understand um, you, you made history in a different kind of way. I mean, you made history by going into the military, but you <laughs> also made history in another way. Tell me about that. Well, I was in sports. I was four years all-conference baseball player in college, played basketball and football, and used to play in what they called the Denver Post Tournament in Denver. And Satchel Page came out here as a pitcher with the Kansas City, Kansas City Monarchs. And I fortunately, the first time I batted against him, got a hit. After I got the hit, he told me, you're not going to get another one, and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you feel getting that hit off of him? Oh, it was fun. And he was a great, good natured guy, great sense of humor. He had some great stories. He had, uh, his first baseman was the first one to wear a long first base glove like they have now. They called him Suits, Suitcase Simpson. And he had a center fielder, and his name doesn't come to me, but he said he was the fastest player that ever played. Satchel roomed with him. He said when they'd go to bed, he'd turn out the light, he'd be in the bed before it was dark. And he said one day he hit a ball over second base and it hit him in the back when he was rounding second base. This was <laughs> <laughs> so Satchel, had, he was a great person. Wonderful. Any other stories you want to share no, with us? No, that's fine. That's it? Okay. okay. Thanks again for all your time. Okay. Hold on just a sec. We've got to get the mic off. Oh, oh yeah.